this is the OnePlus 9 Pro, and it came out a few days ago on April 2nd, and leading up to its launch, OnePlus certainly built up its hype by announcing its partnership with Hasselblad. Now, this isn't the first time that Hasselblad has partnered up with a mobile phone company. They've done it with Motorola before, and uh, it's definitely led to some disappointment. But this is the first time that they really promised somewhat of a unique camera system, though many met that announcement with a good bit of skepticism, which is understandable. But OnePlus, as part of its campaign, started releasing a lot of images that were taken with its Hasselblad ambassadors, and some of the imagery was just stunning. And you would really never be able to tell that it came out of a phone. So they definitely showed a ton of promise. Then it landed into reviewers' hands. And to say that I was disappointed by their coverage would be a massive understatement. Unfortunately, almost every single reviewer that I saw at least, basically just pointed the camera at a wall, said, eh, this is whatever, and moved on. Now, I, I can understand you gain a good bit of fatigue as most phones are just kind of the same these days, and they all just have very underwhelming advancements, so it can kind of feel repetitive. But the problem is that nothing was special about the point and shoot functions, which were definitely how most people I think are gonna be using the cameras. And a lot of the criticism was that the color science just wasn't that impressive. The problem is you don't get that color science and you don't get that 12-bit color data out of the straight point and shoot feature. You need to use Hasselblad Pro Mode. That's the whole thing. It has a whole big branding around that Pro Mode and almost no reviewer covered that feature, thereby kind of making the whole review of the camera somewhat incomplete and incompatible. I mean, it's kind of like reviewing a Jeep Wrangler and then only covering its highway driving abilities when that's not exactly what it was tended for. So anyway, the whole point of this video is to take a deep dive into what the 12-bit Hasselblad Pro mode is like and exactly what the quality of the images are that you should expect. Now to preface it, I am a professional photographer. About 95% of my income is made behind a camera. So I can say that I'm at least a little bit qualified in running this camera through its paces. So let's dive right in. So first we need to go uh, into a little bit of what's new here and what's important about this camera system. Now the sensor itself is a custom Sony IMX789 sensor which is 48 megapixels with dual native ISO, which is particularly helpful in these lower light situations, especially with video. And it does have 8K uh, recording and more on that later. Now this main lens has a 23 millimeter uh, focal point equivalent, which I think it's actually about a six millimeter lens, but it, uh, due to its projection to the sensor, it's about a 23 millimeter equivalent, which is fairly wide for a main shooter. And it also does uh, feature optical image stabilization, which is also particularly helpful in video modes without having, you know, you know electronic stabilization, where, which it does have, you do have the option for it, but with optical, you don't need to crop in on the video and cut some data out to make the electronic stabilization. So. Optical is nice, because then it's just the lens system that's moving around making those adjustments. It's also important to note that this main camera shooter, the custom sensor, is the only one that has the Hasselblad Pro mode, which means that it's the only camera on this phone that uses their special colors and can shoot in RAW. And I, I don't exactly know why only one can do that, uh, I don't see why they wouldn't be able to add raw feature, the raw feature to the ultra wide in the future uh, through a software update. They've fixed their cameras before in the past, and I would definitely welcome seeing that on the ultra wide. And speaking of the ultra wide, the ultra wide camera on this phone is a 50 megapixel sensor with a uh, with a 14 millimeter lens equivalent. Again, raw isn't supported on the ultra wide which I think is kind of silly because that would be a fantastic focal length to get the most out of RAW when you're trying to uh, edit the colors, move them around a bit and get a little bit more detail. So I would definitely hope that they update that in the future, though 
I don't think they will. Aside from that is the 77 millimeter telephoto lens at eight megapixels. Um, probably not gonna get too much use out of that because typically they will favor the main sensor and just do a digital crop on it. After all, 48 megapixels, you can do a fair bit of crop on that. Uh, but yeah, the telephoto's there. It's kind of like a given where every phone needs to have one now. And it also features a two megapixel monochrome sensor, which is kind of an interesting addition. And I don't think, I think a lot of people might be kind of confused by it, but maybe I can shed a little bit of light on why this is an interesting choice. A lot of the descriptors I've seen of it describe it as the depth sensor. Now, being a monochrome sensor, I could definitely see that uh, having the increased detail and contrast that you know monochrome would have, it would be a good way to differentiate on depth. But at its core, it's just a black and white sensor. With a normal color sensor, it breaks the image down into three channels. Now that's three different layers uh, to the sensor, a red, a green, and a blue. And as light passes through the filters on the sensor, it separates the color waves to their uh, respective channel. So in doing that, there is a little bit of loss in detail uh, per pixel just because of the color separation process. Now with a monochrome sensor, it just has a, it just has luminance to worry about and it doesn't have to separate the colors. So each pixel can hold a little bit more detail and in theory, uh, possibly even do better with noise and low light. So that's kind of neat, huh? So the problem is that at two megapixels, you can't really get too much detail packed into that image, can you? Which is odd because when I've taken pictures with the monochrome sensor, uh, it says that the image is a 4,000 by 3,000 uh, resolved image, which is the same as the 12 megapixel binned image. So are they up it? It's kind of like a mildly confusing, confusing addition to the camera bump, but if it has utility, I can't really fault it. All right, so back to what this video is really all about. It's the Hasselblad Pro Mode. And shooting RAW files on a phone isn't exactly new. A lot of flagship phones have been doing this for a few years now. But what is new is the 12-bit RAW color that it shoots in, which is a crazy amount of data to be shot on a phone. For reference, my last phone, the OnePlus 7 Pro, shot in 8-bit RAW. And the quality was pretty good, uh, but 8-bit offers 16 million, uh, 16 and a half million possible colors, which sounds like a lot, but 12-bit offers 68 billion, with a B, possible colors, which is a considerable amount more, uh, which means that there's more color accuracy, there's less banding when shifting between color gradients, such as guys, for instance, and it also gives you a little bit more leeway when editing the colors in post. And I have to say, this checks out. Over the course of a week I of owning uh, this phone, I took it on a few different shoots and put it through some really challenging lighting scenarios and it handled itself really well. What was especially noticeable was how well it did with the sky colors and how smoothly it transitioned from the lighter parts to the darker parts. It also did fairly well with dynamic range, mind you, of course, for a phone. I don't mean the artificially post-processed dynamic range, I mean just the raw data and what was recoverable in the highlights and shadows. Though there was considerably less leeway when using a uh, professional mirrorless camera, which I hope would be obvious, but not just for the file formats though. Most uh, mirrorless cameras now shoot like 14-bit RAW. This is more of the limitation of the sensor size and just the sheer optics of the lens. There's only so much you can like pass through those tiny little lenses. So you really can't expect too much, but what it does deliver is incredibly impressive. So I noticed when exposing a shot, I had to make sure that I got the exposure pretty good or really close. Otherwise, either the shadows or the highlights wouldn't be recovered as well. In some images, the blown out bits just couldn't move and were lost completely. As for some of the darker shadows, if the lighting was extreme, I couldn't really pull back from it too much. Though if I had to choose, I think I would still rather underexpose slightly uh, than be overexposed because raising the exposure in Lightroom seemed to help out a lot with some of those shadow problems instead of just raising the shadows because sometimes it just wouldn't push as far. 
Though in most cases, you could really have good exposures despite the more challenging scenarios. For example, in this image, every part is equally exposed despite it being in front of a window. We still have a lot of good detail in the background as well as the foreground. Other shots like this one in Centennial Park edited really well despite direct sunlight facing the lens. And we can still see a lot of detail in the back of the 96 uh, Olympics monument. This photo of the Hard Rock Cafe in downtown Atlanta I found to be especially appealing, especially with its color vibrance. I edited this photo with only Snapseed on my phone, so if you don't have Lightroom, Snapseed is a free program that is uh, more than just a little easy to use. And I'd even be happy printing this photo. Turns out the Hard Rock Cafe liked it too. One thing you would never typically think of doing on a mobile phone is astrophotography. But as long as you have a tripod, you can do it actually fairly well on this phone. Granted, I don't live in the ideal place to shoot stars because I do live kind of near a city. I still think this is pretty good, especially coming from a phone. Shooting nighttime photos in RAW is way better than using the nightscape mode when you're actually trying to maintain detail. In some shots, I did find some fringing on some of the detailed edges around the highlighted portions, uh, but it was pretty minimal. And in some cases, it still was a whole lot better than some of my professional mirrorless cameras that I've used. And it's still really easy to remove in Lightroom should you notice it. Now, one of my biggest pet peeves for mobile images is the heavy processing and digital sharpening of the images that if you zoom in really close, it just looks like a bunch of like squiggles. So if you shoot in RAW on this phone, it just simply will not be there, not, not at all. And it just kind of looks like a scanned film. It's amazing. Though uh, to start, a lot of the times, it does look a little bit softer than you may like. Uh, so you could definitely add a little bit of sharpening in post within good taste. But if you're, if you're uh, adding the sharpness, it's always better to have that control instead of like letting the AI try to figure it out. And if you're posting these images to Instagram, which would be a typical use case for a mobile phone photo. Sharpening the images is usually a pretty good idea because of how small uh, the portion of the screen it takes up. So let's take a look at this home that I shot as an example. The raw format really does look excellent and it was super bright that day, but each portion of the frame is very well exposed. And by reducing the highlights and raising the shadows a little bit, we can really see and make this home stand out a little bit better. By adding a little bit of vibrance and greening the grass up a little bit, this basically is magazine ready. And if I were to hand this uh, photo to you, I don't think there would be any possible way you could tell that this came from a phone. Unless of course you looked at the metadata. <laughs> So let's take a bit break from the raw images and talk about video on this camera. It's decent. Certainly an upgrade from years past and the inclusion of 120 FPS in 4K is uh, definitely appreciated. Because in a lot of cases, 120 FPS is what you're going to want for slow motion footage. Now they do have 1080p 240, but it's a way softer and way less detailed than shooting in 4K 120. And you also have the option to shoot in the ultra wide lens at these higher resolutions as well. And you also even have the option to shoot in the ultra wide 21 by nine, like cinema 4K style, which is excellent. Of course, the big buzzword this year is 8K recording. And it's here, but I don't think it's gonna be exactly what you want it to be. Though I did notice an increase in detail it makes a good can candidate for downsampling to 4K for that extra detail. But like the 8K for itself in 8K, uh, just, it, it isn't fantastic, I have to say. There was a lot of odd artifacting going on, uh, like in these strange lines, if you zoomed in a little bit. And a lot of the portions of the framing just looked chunky. And the bit rate wasn't exactly extraordinarily high either. Though it is a variable data rate, I did notice that the averages were around 143 megabits a second, which 
isn't exactly everything because uh, I, they, they could have possibly just gotten more efficient codecs than in the past. But the OnePlus 7 Pro's 4K at 60 frames per second was about 160 megabits a second, which, well, it's more, more data. And the 4K 60 on this phone averages somewhere around 67 megabits a second, so it's like less than half. 67 to 100, to be fair. 4K 30 is about 40 megabits a second, and 4K 120 is about 170 to 180 megabits a second. The video quality is really good uh, when just looking at it, and in control environments, I could see you getting really nice footage. Though a lot of times it does seem a little bit soft and the more shadow detail spots which I guess should be expected from a tiny sensor. And it did surprisingly well with color grading and, you know, just kind of playing with the colors yourself. And having the ability to get 4K 120 for some mobile B-roll shots is very handy. If you're going to use 8K, I recommend just using it to downsample to 4K for a little extra detail in your shots. Uh, although they do seem to edit a little bit more harshly and they're a little bit more difficult to manage and you will lose out on some extra stability in the lens itself. So I've been going on for a while now, and there's probably a whole lot more I could talk about, with, uh, especially with the raw images. But I think I covered most of the important bits so far. I think the constant improvement in mobile cameras is really important, and I do appreciate it a step up. I've re received a lot of criticism in the past for focusing so much on you know, mobile phones and their cameras, but I think there is something that's important about it. There's just a lot of moments in life that just are enjoyed less when you have to lug around a big camera and really like think about what you're holding and operating in that way. And sometimes just the best camera is the one you carry with you. And being able to have something a lot more low key like that, that I can carry with me everywhere, it's just, it's just better. I mean, obviously there's professional scenarios that I'm not going to take my phone to, but there's also some professional scenarios in like documentary filmmaking where, you know, you might not want to get a permit to record in some places, or you might not want to be as conspicuous with a big old camera and being able to record something from a phone that's not going to draw any attention, you'll be able to get a lot more natural moments for your footage. I, I've actually been kicked out of some public places before with my big camera uh, because they said no professional cameras here, you have to get a permit. And I'm just not gonna get attacked if I have a phone <laughs> and recording video. So there are advantages in that regard and being able to take much better quality footage with a phone is definitely important, I think. So I think that's all I have to say for today. I'm excited to see what this partnership with Hasselblad will entail in the future. Uh, because right now it's been more or less just sort of an advisory partnership and uh, influence on the color science and all that and some of the design, but they haven't actually built anything yet. In the future, they're supposed to be actually building out some of the hardware for these cameras, which will be interesting to see. So if you want to check out some of my photos that I've been taking on this camera, uh, the best place to do that would probably be Instagram. You can find me there at LaPlanet Arts. And it's also the better place to see all my behind the scenes footage and just kind of see what kind of projects I'm getting up to. And I really mean it now, I am closing the video. Thanks for watching, I'll see you guys later.